um, make sure we are recording. The recording will be available after we wrap up tonight. It takes some time to process and for us to switch the website over to replay instead of register. Uh, so by noon tomorrow, Eastern Standard Time, you will be able to see the replay on the website, same place you registered. I'll put that link in the chat box in a few minutes as well. And then you can review or you can share with colleagues once it's posted there on the website. So I will continue to put some of those notes in the chat box, but we'll let Tan and Beth get started. Would you like to introduce yourselves to the group? Sure. Go ahead, Tan. My name is Tan Nguyen, and I'm currently coming to you from Cambodia. This is the school where I work at. There's a little corner on the left-hand side. That's where I work. And I spend 100% of my time co-teaching and co-planning. I don't have any students, quote unquote, on my roster. This is an example of my art class that I co-teach in. I teach in two art classes and many, many more. So I support 200 students in two grades. I also, on my free time, quote, quote, free time, I consult when I'm uh, able to in person and also virtually a lot. Let me introduce you to Beth. Hi, and I'm Beth Skelton. I see a lot of my Colorado colleagues in here. I am currently a full-time presenter and a coach and a consultant. And I live here in beautiful Western Colorado. This is a view from my home and it looks like that still today in mid-March. Spring has not sprung in my world. We are so excited that you are all here today. Um, and so we're already jumping into the chat, introducing yourself. And this is how we're gonna add to what's already in the chat. Get those fingers ready because when you introduce yourself, we'd love to know where in the world you are right now and which languages other than English you speak. So many of you have already dropped in where you're from and we've got just a lot of the world represented, but drop in the chat in addition to the other languages you speak. That would be great. Oh my goodness. Look, look at the languages coming in from Polish to Spanish. Um, wow, Polish to French, Dutch, French, German, Italian and Spanish. Oh my, Creole, fabulous. We've got Portuguese, um, Serbo-Croatian, Cantonese. This is fabulous. Korean. I knew there was going to be a lot. We've got Spanish and German. Um, look at that. My sense is that in this room, we have a lot of multilingual learners. That means a lot of you know what it's like to be a multilingual learner yourself. And that's what's going to transition us in to this group of students that we're going to focus the rest of our session on is who are what we're calling experienced multilinguals. And these are a special group of students that up until we hope we're making a shift, they have been known as long-term English learners. And the only definition that really exists, um, it comes from the United States, from the Every Student Succeeds Act. And of course, because it's federal, it's a lot of words, but basically, it's in that Every Student Succeeds Act. It says that educational agencies have to report on this subgroup of students of English language learners who have not attained English proficiency within five years of initial classification as an English learner and their first enrollment in a local education agency, meaning a school. All right. So if that is this very wordy federal definition in the United States of um, who these students are, if you had to write a summary statement, if you had to say like in a few words, what does this mean? Who are these students? And you can just type, type a few phrases in the chat. That would be great. A summary statement for who are experienced multilinguals according to our US federal definition. A lot of words, let's reduce it. Can, I can see the folks are starting to think about how would I, yes, yes, six plus, Andrew Scholes, you got it. That means if they've had five years, if they haven't done it within five years, that means in their sixth year of being in our local schools, we would consider them this group of students that we are advocating to call experienced multilinguals. And it's more, yeah, five or more years, however you want to do it. Thank you, you guys fabulous summary statement. 
students classified as English learners for six or more years. That's what we have to go on. Now, this group, as we said, has been classified and the term that has been used in the United States and around the world up until now is this um, title long-term English learners. And everyone who works with this group of students and everyone who is in researching, they all say, we don't like the term because it focuses on their deficits. And so we're gonna try to flip that switch and focus on their assets, take an asset-based approach. And our new book, this is all about their assets because we believe these students are experienced multilinguals. They have experience, at least five years of experience in our systems, in our schools. They have been learning in English for at least five years. They're not newcomers. They know how to open their locker. They get the cafeteria system. They know how to deal with you know, the books and the, the hallway system. They have tons of experience. So in a lot of ways, they're different than other groups of multilingual learners. We want to build on that experience. And we know that they have at least one other language, if not multiple other languages, in addition to English, and we're going to build on that asset as well. With that in mind, I'd like you to think of just one experienced multilingual you're currently working with or have worked with in the past. Um, and, and with that in mind, say, okay, who is this student in your mind, right? You've got a picture of them, and this is a student that started maybe in kindergarten or second grade, and now maybe they're in sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth grade, right? All right, you've got that student. All right, now I'd like to have you think of either one asset, an asset that this experienced multilingual brings to the classroom, or a success that they've actually experienced this school year. Like you've worked with them and you're like, wow, look at that success. We're going to really practice with an asset-based approach by thinking of that asset or success. Now, we've provided some sentence frames like one asset this experienced multilingual brings to the classroom is, you do not have to type that whole sentence frame, or the success is maybe this student experienced success this year when, just fill in the second half. If you would, let's get some real assets of this group of learners out in the chat. Go ahead and type away those successes or assets. Oh my gosh, April, fast on the draw. Many of these students are balancing life and work outside of school, and they're doing it with finesse. Many of them work in multilingual environments outside of the school day. Brilliant. Thank you, April. Grown with their ap um, academic vocabulary. Jessica, I love that moving seamlessly between all of their languages. Tan, feel free to shout out things that are jumping out at you. No, Bethany, keep going. Yeah, um, the the success is making inferences. They're they're starting to tap into that background knowledge, and class discussions. Um, oh, way to go, Jessica Luce about winning the regional soccer championship, and then he becomes the star. Right now, we've involved him in the school system, and that success builds success in the reg um, in the classroom as well. Um, internalizing the scaffolds. Oh, Mari, we are going to be talking exactly about that, about how students can learn to use those scaffolds that we provide and say, hey, I can do this on my own. Or I can carry this into other um, realms in the room. Oh my gosh, Melissa made the honor roll. Robust vocabulary, great discussion leader, creative and funny from Maggie. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is what excites Tan and me about working with experienced multilingual learners. They have so much they're bringing to the classroom. They trans language, they have tons of background knowledge to make connections. They have peers that they work with. Thank you for taking the time to do that. This is why we wanted to launch with an asset-based approach. And this is actually the very first chapter of our book is all about these assets that you have just dropped in there from our interviews and our experience working with the students. We really want to drop the deficit-based LTEL label, which is on the left side with the little sloth picture that 
the the former like adjectives that come with that label of LTEL, we all know it's those adjectives that are on the left hand side that I can't even say anymore, but it's almost like they're glued together with the label. And so we're shifting this affirming shift to experience multilinguals. And that's why we put that new term up in lights. And it would be fun if you want to try saying that, try it. Try that in your um, environment, try it on for size because it really focuses on their assets. So hopefully that gives you um, how we start this and what we're framing all of this on. This first section where we focused on the asset-based approach, we also modeled some strategies. Tan, do you wanna go ahead and debrief those strategies? Yeah, and the reason why we're sharing these strategies is not just this presentation is part content, but also the strategies that we're going to share for, for the students that are going to use, but also for teachers so that when you present, uh, this might be a tool added to your toolkit. So let's look at the first one. Uh, we looked, we made you interact with us right away to connect your background knowledge with, with, with the share and write. And we ask you, think about a student who is an experienced multilingual. What are they great at? What are they good at? Someone talked about Mexican dancing, another person talked about sharing their culture, another person talked about um, making the honor roll. Rebecca talked about uh, sharing their ideas orally. So you're connecting already this concept that we're sharing about this group of students to something you already know and look at the engagement right there. The next strategy that, we're gonna, that we shared with you is taking a really complex text, having you try to process it, and then us giving you a very student friendly definition of that. The next strategy is using a sentence starter. So we, so the first two, we really did comprehensible input, really the second one, summary statement, comprehensible input. But then, this, then the other one we just did was sentence uh, starter, which is for structuring academic language, which is comprehensible output. So that's like the yin and yang of language instruction for students. And the last strategy that we used was sharing our content in a visual way, right? Because when we see what picture is really worth a thousand words in every language, and so when we can give you something that's visual, you can have an anchor to it and it increases your comprehensible output. Rebecca once asked me when I was at a workshop, he said, of the five scaffolds that you shared, which one is do you think is most helpful? And I would say visual scaffolding, which is part of sensory scaffolding. Thanks, Tan. And I also wanted to share that each of these strategies are things that you can teach students to do. So somebody wrote about how their students are using strategies. They're realizing what they can do for themselves. So they could make a summary statement. You've taught it, taught how to use it for comprehensible input. And after they've read a little bit or after a little bit of um, input from you and a video or a lecture, they can go, oh, here's a summary statement of what I just heard. So they can learn to make their own sentence starters. So each of these are strategies that support our students across all the content areas. The book is based on an instructional framework that leans heavy into Wiggins and McTie's um, understanding by design. So this backwards design idea. What Tan and I have done is put a real language frame on that and how to support our experienced multilinguals from the very beginning all the way through the unit. And with that in mind, we start with a visual of the orchard, sometimes called seeing the forest through the trees, but we're using an orchard for a reason I'll get to in a moment. So if this visual of the orchard, that's the big picture, that's where you're going in the unit, that's the final product, right? And that means your summative assessment. So thinking about what is it I want students to be able to do, what do they have to know by the end of this unit that I'm working on, we can engineer that summative assess assessment to make it accessible for all students using some strategies. So if you're sketch noting along, this would be a great time to make a visual for yourself, a sketch note maybe of an orchard with a little test inside that this is the final summative assessment. Now, once you have that summative assessment in mind and you've engineered it for language so that it becomes a content test, not um, just a reading and writing test, then we look at individual lessons. 
each tree in the orchard leads to the final orchard, right? Like that presents the whole outcome. So each tree, each individual lesson somehow contributes to the whole. And, and we know that because we have a goal already set. Um, we know where the kids are headed for their final assessment. I've been co-planning with a lot of teachers. And the first thing I always ask is, what's your final um, unit summative assessment? And if, if we don't have that, I can't plan any individual lesson and I can't give any strategy because I have to know where we're going. So in this section, we learn how to write an integrated objective that includes language and content. Once we know that, then we're able to provide all of that comprehensible input, the sun and the rain that feed each of the trees, right? That produce the fruit at the end. So this comprehensible input, this is hugely important. And that's where we decide which strategies for scaffolding the input, right? The reading and the, the listening, how do we support students with that? And then finally, because we've given such great input, to support the individual trees in the orchard, that's when we see the fruit and that's our output. So we're structuring that academic language output of writing and speaking. Um, and so our students really can produce beautiful fruits given all of these um, inputs and a clear planning framework. So we've really just played with the understanding by design Wiggins and McKay created a little visual for you so you can understand the framework that um, really structures the whole book. So that's the overview. And maybe you had time to make your own sketch as we were, as I was talking through. And then um, notice that I also modeled a new strategy. I chunked the notes. So when I presented that framework, I didn't give you the whole picture at once. I just chunked each piece as we went through it. Um, and then, right, I provided a metaphor. Now this metaphor was connected to something you know in your world. You know about sun and rain providing, right, inputs for trees. So I connected this understanding by design framework with a metaphor, something visual. And then finally, the sketch note. I made time for you to have a quick sketch moment. Our students can do that. We can teach them how to take sketch notes, writing a few notes um, along the way and the pictures that help visually help them understand. So there's another set of strategies that you can do in your own class as well as teach your students to do. All right, another set now. We're going to move on and start with the orchard. Tom, go ahead. In starting with the orchard is where, when I co-teach with teachers, when I co-plan, I no longer say, so what do you do tomorrow? And I always say now, what do you do by the end of the unit? And this has changed my co-teaching practice. Let me walk with you through two examples of that. So we're going to share with you how to engineer assessments. And there are two types of assessments. There's the knowledge-based assessments that we're very used to, where you sit down, you take a test at the end of the unit. And then there's a more progressive one uh, where user in more like IB schools, where it's a performance-based assessment, where they have to write a report, create a poster, create a video, create something that requires them to apply their research, apply the strategies, apply the skills and content over a series of days, weeks, and even months. Let's, let me show you how to make these uh, more accessible and equitable for students. This is an actual example from my grade seven science class with, that I co-taught with my teacher. Look at, these, look at this um, test right here, and it's, it's actually pretty well scaffolded already. Um, so right here we have questions of, okay, using the following food chain to answer the question A, B. Pretty clear. And then we have an arrow. We have arrows that lead us from lettuce to green flies to ladybirds to all the way to hawk. We have a question about what organism um, is a secondary consumer. And then we have another question that applies down here. If hawks were removed from the food chain, what is most likely to happen? Can you type in the group chat what, um, how, what might prevent experienced multilinguals from fully demonstrating the understanding of this content? Can you type that in? What might cause them to not fully understand these instructions? Being confused about the animals, exactly. Carrie said lack of visuals. 
there are no visuals. Again, Andrew uh, said no visuals. They may not know what the arrows mean. April said language overload intense. Jessica said meaning of secondary and most likely. Uh, Cornelia said not knowing what a hawk or lettuce is. It seems like you have um, looked at my slides next. <laughs> <laughs> because right here, this is what I did. I actually took this assessment and the teacher said, go make it more accessible for students. I said, not a problem. You're crazy busy. I will do this for you and then I'll give it back to you to see if it's okay with you. And then this is what I showed him. I added a picture of a lettuce, a green fly, a ladybug, sparrows, and hawks. Right? So I added icons and images. What is a secondary consumer? I just put it there because students learned what the word secondary consumer is, so I can't scaffold that because then it would be helping them with the content. It's about helping them understand the instructions and how to write their answers. And then the bottom one, the little the table here, we had now arrows going up and down for decrease and increase, which is what Angela Moreno said, the academic vocabulary of decrease and increase. They don't know what that means. Right? And look at here the words, if hawks were removed, maybe students don't know what the word remove means. And so I took, so I added the word taken away. I made sure that I kept the word remove because I want students to have, to see that word remove so that it adds to their academic repertoire. So Beth, can you go back, back to the last slides? Sure. So I want you just to see how, like, unscaff, how this version is one version that we gave to all students. And going to the next slide, how right away visually helpful in scaffolding. We did not make the content easier for students. We made the assessment more equitable for students. Let's keep going on. Yeah, and Tan, just as a quick clarification, because in the chat, it came up that some people talked about secondary consumer. It's a bolded word on there. That is actually a word that was directly taught in the science classroom. So we specifically don't do that. Like Tan said, we don't change that one. That's expected to be taught, but words like removed may not have been taught directly. And so we're looking at, is there anything else in there that would confuse them that wasn't directly taught? Um April said, thank you. This is a great example I would love to share with my colleagues. Yes, this presentation, we made it accessible so that you can present and share and screenshot and share with colleagues as needed. Okay. Uh, yeah, and Ina's asking about translations. Tan, do you want to take that? We'll get there in a second. Yes. Okay, great. So moving on to the thing, the next part. So let's look at this slide here. Here's an example of an unscaffolded instructions. Can you share in the group chat what makes these instructions unscaffolded? Let me read to you the actual instructions. Introduce your, your ecosystem, the food chain in your ecosystem and why it is important. Then present your research on how humans have affected this ecosystem. 500 to 600 words, go write. <laughs> why would this be unscaffolded? I see people saying, like Mari saying, this is multi-step instructions, too many instructions, no visuals. Carrie said too many instructions, not chunked, just like what Beth talked about. When the strategies we use for comprehensible input is the same strategies that we use for comprehensible output. Right. Let's, let me show you how I scaffolded here. So you're right, there are two parts. The first part, can you go back to that, Beth? Uh -huh. There are two parts. The first part is about what is the ecosystem and the second part is the impact. So let me show you what you can do for a multi-step um, instructions. I would put it in a something called an instructional box. Beth, can you click on the next uh, so the transitions go through? So what I did was I, I took section one and I put it in an instructional box, which is the green part. An instructional part clearly labels, this is part one, it's about your ecosystem. Here are the things I would like you to put in your ecosystem paragraph. There are three prompts. Where is your ecosystem? Make sure you tell us the countries, the regions, or the hemispheres. Kids have to use the word hemispheres, maybe regions as well. After you do that, ding, 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 you notice the sequencing? Describe the food chain in your ecosystem. Make sure you talk about producers, primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary consumers, and, uh, uh, and apex predators. So I'm su supporting students with saying, make sure you use these words because I'm gonna be looking for them. And then the last prompt is, why is your ecosystem so important? And what does this mean? It means, what does it produce? And why is it, what does it protect? Okay. So students have to answer these prompts. 
And now imagine all of these scaffolds, so helpful for students and students right on the bottom there. Let me, go, let me show you the next slide. This is part two. So I took the first part and I scaffolded instructional box. Um, and let me show you the, the, the my annotation for it. What I did was, again, I kept the prompt. Describe how humans have disrupted this ecosystem. There are three things I'm looking for specifically. What were the human activities, um, human activities on this ecosystem? What was taken out, reduced in numbers, or lost in the ecosystems? Make sure you say, what was the result on this ecosystem? The last one, what was added or increased in numbers? Look how specific that is. I'm saying what is the result on this ecosystem as well. But here is an extra bonus to this instructional box. I added the academic language for students who need it because I know this is really quite complex. So I said, okay, I'm going to give them the sentence for paragraph frame. If they want to use it, they can. If they do not want to use it, they do not have to, right? Because then they have to know that uh, Okay, I have a developer awareness that I can do this by myself, or sometimes I might look at a model and just change it myself. Let me show you the sentences here. Unfortunately, human activity has disrupted the, your ecosystem. Some of the ways that humans have disrupted the balance of blank are by, as a result of your ecosystem loss, the loss of cause, Da, da, da. I'm not going to read the rest of the sentence, but what do you notice about this scaffolding right here? Can you type in the group chat? What do you notice about what I'm doing here? Erica said, these sentence frames and sentence starters with transitions, words, are very helpful because they help us get students' ideas out so it sounds like a scientist. Right? Beth Gusson, of course, color coding is a great addition as well. Carrie said, frames, thumbs up. Sentence starters break down and enable sing a single response. Sentence frames are academically grade level. Yes. And additionally, I know that we in our field, we often talk about like teaching grammar. There's grammar instruction in here. For example, as a result of comma, unfortunately, comma. So you notice how we're teaching students like there, we learn grammar through using it using the context of what it sounds like, and this is getting them there. Let's move to the next slide. So what I, the key thing that I want to share with you, and this is like a tweetable moment here, is like equitable assessments in content classes assess the content. They are not to assess reading or they're not to be a reading or writing test. This is what it means to be equitable for students because sometimes they can read they understand the content, they can tell you photosynthesis, they can tell you about all the different parts of a food chain, but they can't read the instructions and then therefore, or they can't, uh, they can't communicate their ideas fully, so this becomes an, an equity issue. Let's move on to the next one. This also applies to metacognitive skills, we'll get there right yeah. away. Thanks. You guys are one step ahead is so exciting. So as always, we've modeled lots of things that you can do right away with your assessments. But in that, Tan was also modeling another strategy that's super helpful for our students that you can um, share with them. And that is an annotated example. So when he gave you an example of what it looks like to do an equitable summative assessment, chunking out that performance-based assessment, he annotated it on the side. This is what I've done. So not just here's an example, but then annotating it. And we can do that for our students as well. So if you provide a mentor text or some kind of mentor example or an exemplar, annotate it. What's the first sentence doing? What is this paragraph doing? Like really go through and annotate that so students are very clear and aware of what's going on in the exemplar. Great. And Tan, it's coming up in the chat. Why don't you address those metacognitive skills? Yeah. So when we said experience multilinguals, we wanted to tell them they have all these experiences. They have all these skills that they come with. What in the really quite older in age? Well, how can we make them more independent because they have these skills? Well, we have to teach students metacognitive skills and saying, how can I learn how to learn? Or how can, what do I need to be successful? So for example, 
we can teach students that in the future when they have an assessment and it's not scaffolded, they can ask for the prompts, the guiding questions, and the segmentation of the instruction. So you might say, hi teacher, um, I know that you asked us about writing an ecosystem. Can you give me more um, instructions on, on the, the types of information I should give? Can you give me some guiding questions? That's the easiest part. Well, the teachers aren't going to be thrown off by like, what? Teach students this phrase. Can you give me some guiding questions? By the way, I'm looking at the videos um, of those who are opening, turning on their videos, and I see people writing, and I love the engagement. And that, I think that started during the sketch noting that Beth shared. Let me go to the next slide for you. Yes, Grace. So now we looked, let me go back. Um, so now we looked at the assessment and which is the orchard. We're gonna to move to our daily lessons, which is the trees. We'll give you something about that later. But when we look at designing our lessons after our integrated objectives, which we'll give you in a second, we really think about two lenses. We look, about, we look at how do we establish comprehensible input for students. If they don't understand, they're not gonna be able to produce. Right? So let's go here. We call that the sun and the rain. So comprehensible input is can you go? It's our goal is to make ideas understandable, such as presentations, videos, and articles. Everything that we're doing right now in this video presentation so far, we're modeling how do we make it comprehensible for teachers. Let's move on to the next slide. Here is an example. This is an actual article that I had my sixth graders read. This is a text that's above their grade level, and I'd like you to answer this question without simplifying this text what could teachers do to make this text more comprehensible for students who can decode? So, so these students are able to key code the text and able to read every single word here. But what can we do to make the text more comprehensible? Right? Oh, I love Grace. Grace, you're so active. If they can't understand, they can't produce. Uh, pickles, that's cute. Says graphics. Uh, uh, Desney, uh, Denise said, chunk it out. Absolutely. Do you notice how the things that we're sharing and how do we make when we present uh, content to students, like chunking it out, is also how we can share with students when they read it themselves. Andrew Go says, text engineering or chunking it. <gasps> how do you know what text engineering is? Oh my goodness, Andrew. <laughs> and then oh, Rochelle, glossary pictures. Eileen said, vocabulary instruction. James said, amplify the text. And Sunny said, pre-teach vocabulary. Let me go to the next slide for you. This is the exact same first three paragraphs that you saw in the video. This is what I did. Let me show you my annotation. I, well, Beth helped me by saying, why is Bangkok sinking? So this text didn't really have chunks, like guiding questions or sections. And so I broke it out into sections. And Beth said, instead of t putting titles in the sections, why don't you just add guiding questions? And so this is fabulous. That's another example of when you collaborate with your English language uh, development specialist, you become a better teacher, right? So that, thank you for that, for Beth. These are the things that I did. I added synonyms after the academic words. For example, let's look at this first sentence. For more, than, more or less than 10 million people living in Thailand's capital of Bangkok, flooding is a common and reoccurring phenomenon. Really tough sentence because of the syntax, the sentence structure, but look at these words. Reoccurring, phenomenon, really difficult. So I added the words repeating and the word event. Let's look at the next sentence, which is really difficult. This is partly due to the city's geographical, geographic location at the southern end of the Chao Praia River Basin, as well as this low-lying terrain. That's a really difficult sentence where it says low-lying terrain, so I added the phrase. A flat area without hills or mountains. And this is what I did. Because the content is about a flat area in Bangkok, I added a picture into the right hand side, which was not part of the original article. And I text engineered, just like Andrew said. I added a picture so it corresponds with the text. So the kids see a flat area and the kids see the city in the back. In addition, for the kids who uh, I also, in a, I mostly have students who are experienced multilinguals, but I have some kids who are beginners. So this is what I did. I added a teacher produced caption. So, and I told them and I differentiated for them. I said, don't read the other black text. I want you to read just the blue one because you're a beginner. And students read the text. And for students who needed a little more support, 
I read a recording of the text for them and, and I put this on each slide. So like th this is an example of a slide and this slide then has me re uh, reading the article to them. So that's what I did for kids. And let me go to the next slide. So I just taught you, I just showed you how I text engineered um, an article. This is from Walken, uh, Alec Leakey Walken. And, and I said, how do we help students become more independent because text won't be engineered for them in the future? Well, we can teach kids a metacognitive skill of annotating their own text. So someone talked about translating. And so this is what I did. I gave students, my eighth graders, this actual article. Um, the most humiliating portion of the treaty for, of the treaty defeated the Germ for the defeated Germany was Article 231, commonly known as the War Guilt Clause. A really tough sentence. I didn't make it easier for students. But I told students to do this. As they're reading together with a partner, they have to add words that they don't understand. For example, the word portion, I engineered it myself. I added the word part. For the word war guilt clause, I added the word statement. The word initiating, I, I, I added the word starting. There's missing a G and N. But for kids, I didn't translate the word humiliating for them. They had to do it themselves. For the word the clause force, I thought kids knew what the word force was, but when my kids worked together in, in this shared document, the student had to translate it in Khmer and Korean. So we're teaching students that when the teacher is not engineering the text for you, you can do this for yourself. This is how they become long term successful for the long term. Let's move to the next slide. Let me show you a video uh, in a second of students collaborating, of reading collaboratively. They're going to be, these are uh, students who are Thai and they're going to be speaking English. And they're going to be, what the, their goal is to read an, a, a text and they're processing the text. The goal is not to practice reading fluency. Their goal is to read to, and to talk to comprehend. They read one sentence, they stop, they talk about what they should really write for the annotation. Really, they stop at the paragraph and they write about it. Let's watch this video. Which give them a better standard of living? No, the same thing. Yeah, which... Um, which, which um, makes their lives better? I don't know. Yeah, which makes their lives better? Okay. Okay, next one. Who's gonna read? You, because we swap. Okay. No, it's your turn to read. No, oh, you read two by two. Oh, China is a great example of a country that has benefited immensely from global. So you notice this was during like COVID times. That was fun, right? Um, we, I had to get my students, my students were used to reading together in person before we went on COVID. So we took this strategy and had them use it virtually again. Look how they're processing the text, saying, what do you think this means? Listening to each other, talking about it and writing it down. Ina had a good question of saying, what about giving them a fully translated text? That would be great for students who um, are developing, who are beginning in English, yet we're working with students who are experienced so they have decoding skills already. What a great question, you know. Next slide. So, oh, go ahead. So um, this is the, let me show you the instructions for a collaborative reading protocol. So you, partner A reads the text or a paragraph out loud. Then partner B asks a question, makes a connection or paraphrase the paragraph together with the partner. Oftentimes, I have my students just paraphrase the paragraph together. Sometimes they ask a question, sometimes they make a connection, but my goal is to get them to summarize. And the last step is for them to annotate, discuss, and then annotate, and then they switch roles. So not one person is just reading, or not just one person is writing. Right? And this is the thing that I tell my kids, this is the trick. Whoever has the idea cannot write that answer down. It has to be given to the next partner. Right? This is what I do. So for example, let's say that Beth has the idea, which she always usually does. <laughs> she doesn't write it down. I write it down. So then I get the chance to process that and use that academic language as well. That's a little like Yoda ninja, tri ninja trick. <laughs> I trick.
That was a Yoda ninja trick right there, Tan. Um, Tan just shared so many strategies for comprehensible input. And during that, he was also modeling, in addition, some modeling of additional strategies that may not have been clear. And this is our metacognitive moment. What else was Tan doing? Well, he showed a video to increase comprehension. And that video had a very specific point. It was very short, just kind of um, building how does this protocol work? Notice that the video came before the directions. So you had that experience of watching the kids follow the protocol. As Kelly said in the chat, wow, they didn't even need any intervention. They debated, no, two by two. No, you're next. Like they knew the protocol and what to do. And then they typed in the chat bar, like this is our summary statement. So that was really powerful, but you got to see it before we gave you the steps. The other thing that Tom did was these step-by-step -step visual instructions. So for each piece of the protocol of partner reading, we had a visual for you and he explained it step by step. So that was another way of strategy of informational text. Tan, I am looking at time and I know that we have to end at 45 minutes and we've got some very clear um, end goals here. So I am just gonna say the next part of our framework and the next part is this output and how do we support output for students and in the text in the book we really dive into a lot of ways of supporting that vocabulary development as well as their sentence structures as well as the whole discourse level so that students can read and write and speak like scientists mathematicians historians and so we really provide a lot of that. Um, somebody said, can we go an extra little bit of, you guys are onto it, we'll stay. I didn't want to you know, cut it out, but thanks for being so engaged. Um, we'll go a little bit over, but I do want to respect time. I know it's after school. Han shared about all the comprehensible input ideas. The book goes into many, many more, but that gives you an overview of some of the ideas that we share. Once they've got lots and lots of input, as somebody in the chat had said, once you understand, then you can start to output. And this comes from crashing from the early 80s, right, is that I have to be able to understand before I can express myself in speaking and in writing academically. So this is also going to support that academic expression. As you remember from the very beginning, these experienced multilinguals are not newcomers. They can probably express their content understanding with a lot of social language already, but we want to build them into really experts in the discipline. And that's maybe one of the tweaks that helps them move that goes beyond the label of English learner, and that's helping them with their output. And so, Tan, if you would describe just a few fairly brief ways they can structure, we can structure our academic output, that would be great. So let me give you a context. In grade 10, I had to teach business writing. So these are all the things I had to have my 10th graders write about. Overwhelming, right? So we applied it to something that's more accessible, which is a food truck. So let me show you what I did. Next slide. Um, one of the parts of the of the of the a business plan was they had to write a promotion. So what I did was I went in the world in uh, Thailand and I, because I was in Thailand at that time, and I looked for authentic model examples of promotions. I took pictures, I took screenshots. This is on the right hand side. It isn't actually a screenshot facing the mall, facing the gym where I used to go out. And I was like, this is a wonderful example. Let me take a picture for kids. And it's culturally responsive because most of my students are Thai. Right? Next. And this is what I did. I just didn't give them just a model text. Can you click on the annotations? I gave them detailed instructions of how to do it. For my 10th graders, I didn't give them the instructional box that I showed you with my 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th graders. For my 10th graders who were close to IB, like DP, I just gave them a really clear written instructions. And then this is what I did. I said, go try it. And this is what they produce. Next slide. They then... Um, wrote a text, and then what I did was I took the top, um, one of the highest proficient for examples, and then I annotated for students. And I said, I didn't want to give you my example. There was an authentic text. I gave you really clear instructions because sometimes 10th graders would just go, give me the model text. I'll write it just like the model text, right? So I wanted them to think critically. Then I took and then I took an example of a student's response, which is again, uh, like giving them um, confidence and culture be responsive. I took the text and I said, before I give you the annotations, 
I want you to sit in your small groups and annotate this text and to say what did Pan do in this paragraph to make it so that he earned the earned the privilege of being highlighted in this presentation. Right? So here are all the things that he did. He gave a specific cultural event connected to the uh, to the uh, food truck theme. He gave a specific time frame. He explained the math behind the promotion, and he explained how the promotion will benefit the food truck. Let me read you the few sentences, just a few sentences. Grade 10. For BKK Kebabs one week a year special promotion, we have decided to hold a Cinco de Mayo celebration named Cinco de Mayo Cocktail Party. Held on Cinco de Mayo, May 5th, this celebration lasts for one every day for one week, giving time for consumers to tell others about the promotion, effectively providing free advertisement and increasing customers. Now, do you notice if I just gave them sentence starters, they would just fill this in? But um, look, I was so proud of Pan of how he thought critically about this, using my instructions, thinking about the model text, producing his own. Next slide, please. So this is the metacognitive strategy. Teach students to ask for a mentor text that they can analyze. If the teacher doesn't give them a mentor text, to say, hi, can you just help me, um, give me an example of what this would look like, and, and then I'll try to figure it out myself. Right? This is how they can become independent for the long term. Next slide, please. Here so is... We... <laughs> yeah, this is our lesson plan template um, that shows it starts with that end of unit summative assessment, the orchard, with that integrated content objective, which we didn't go into, but it tells how we get there. We talked about establishing comprehensible input and structuring academic output. There's a copy for that. If you put your phone up there, it'll take you right into a copy that you can use. Um, in the course, we'll guide you through how to create your own unit plans using this template, which is again, based on understanding by design. Sorry, Tan. <laughs> no worries, Beth, can you uh, click out and then refresh this page? Cause then I added a link uh, because teachers, can you go back and uh, yeah. just like uh, refresh, refresh, not that link. Yeah, I can't do that, sorry. Does okay. it go, yeah. Uh, on the presentation slide, there is an, a, right, a little QR code on the right-hand side where you can get the book for 25% off if you are not going to join their course, which is fine. You can still get the book for 25% off in Corwin. We, I've already added that for you there. And the template is already included in the book, but you already have this free version here for you that you can right away start. This is how we plan our lessons as well. Yeah. Super. So as Kelly's been dropping in the chat, we do have a 15 hour book study course that 15 contact hours includes reading time. So it's all together. Um, we're going to start, we'll launch that in June. We have some interactive videos that go along with some reading time and some practice time for you to start planning lessons. So you'll be ready for the fall um, with some lessons that are already scaffolded for our experienced multilinguals. Again, this student group is students that have been in our system learning in English for five or more years, six or more years. Um, so they have a lot of experience. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. We hope that this provides them long-term success. And we've seen that happening, Tan. And I want to say what Gracie said. I always usually end my presentation by saying, like, we do this, all of these things is because clear is kind. Like Dr. B what Dr. Brown, uh, Dr. Br Brene Brown said, when we have clear instructions, it is really kind for students. We're not making it easier. That's not actually making it kind for them. When we provide clear instructions, this is kind. And I hope that this, uh, this book, these courses will create the conditions where we can, we can create clarity for students. Thank you so much for being here this evening, afternoon on a really busy Monday. We appreciate you very, very much. Thank you for everyone coming out and um, sharing your learning with us in the chat. This is Kelly. Wanted to say thank you to Beth and Tan for presenting. I always love it comes in like warp speed, but we have the handout link. And um, as I said before, we are recording. And so once we log off, we'll process the video and start building our replay page. Everyone who registered for this webinar will get an email if you haven't um, unsubscribed from email. You will get an email saying that the replay is ready. If you don't see that email by lunchtime tomorrow, 
then there's probably an issue with um, email blocking or something like that, spam filters. And so you would just go right back to where you registered um, to the um, English Learner Portal page. Let me find that link. I know I posted it before. And Kelly, while you're looking, there was a question that came through to me in a direct message. I think it was meant to be for you, but it was asking about um, a certificate for today's attendance. I don't know if you're planning to do that, but that would be a question whoever asked that for Kelly um, for English Learner Portal. Okay, if you need a certificate for today's attendance, you can email, I'm putting her email in the box there, Katie at EnglishLearnerPortal.com. Let her know that you attended this webinar tonight. Give her some context because she gets lots of emails. Let her know that you attended the webinar tonight and um, that you would like a certificate for that one hour of participation and she can help you out with that. If you have questions about anything else of finding this course, finding Beth and Tan's other courses, of finding the replay video, you are always welcome to email me at info at EnglishLearnerPortal.com. And you can also email Katie uh, with those kinds of questions too. She can answer just about everything. Tom, can you drop that link? I, for some reason, am only able to send direct messages. Something got mixed up with my Zoom. Could you drop the link um, into the chat if you have that handy or just the code for the yeah. discount? Thank you so the, much. The code is coming right now. No, thank, thank you to, to those in the chat who are helping to repost. That help that helps us keep track of everything. Thank you. And if you're already going to be subscribing to the course, the book is included as part of the payment. As part of the fee. Right. Thank you. So the sooner you register, the better. So we make sure your book gets to you on time, uh, from the time it's published to the time we can ship it out to you. Uh, but we will take registrations for the course right up to the start date in June. Your book just may be a little bit late getting there if you register at the last minute. Um, these are the questions that come up from district personnel. Um, so let me answer those right up front. Yes, we can do cohorts. Yes, we accept purchase orders. So if you have a group of people you would like to get together to register for the course, we would need you to collect their names and email addresses so we can set them up with accounts and we'd be happy to help you do that moving forward as well. Email me for that info at EnglishLearnerPortal.com. So I think we took care of all the, the logistics there. So I just want to say thank you again to Tan and Beth. As you were talking, I, I haven't seen your book yet. Um, so I wasn't sure exactly what to expect, but I know if you did it, it would be amazing. And it was just everything that I have been doing with a couple districts to scaffold their existing assessments. And so it, it made me feel good about what we're doing. And it made me very excited that this kind of information can get out into everybody's hands now. So thank you for putting it in print. <laughs> That's and a Kelly, lot of work. That was the goal. We were saying, how do we give this book to teachers who are, who are content teachers? They have never had a training. How do we, and they've never went to university for this. How do we make the most accessible, student-friendly, teacher-friendly, content-based book for teachers who are working with middle and high school students who are not beginners. So that's yeah, definitely. Well, from the bits you shared, it looks like you you hit a home run on that. And I can't wait to see my copy. <laughs> All right. If you have any questions, um, I can hang on for a couple minutes to answer any questions in the chat box. Uh, if you do not, then uh, enjoy your evening, your day, whichever time zone you're in. And again, uh, you'll receive an email when that replay is ready. Feel free to share that link with anybody you want to. Once we put it out there, it's open for everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate your participation in the chat and for uh, throwing all your ideas in there as well. So thank you again. Bye -bye. Danke, gracias. Thank you all for being here. It was lovely to see so many friendly faces and names in the chat. We appreciate you.